Are you a believer? Or are you a follower? Are you a believer? Or are you a follower? Put my PowerPoint up there. can't worship in this moment, then I suggest that you are just a believer. Pastor, that sounds pretty harsh, is it? We see a lot of people in this world that believe that Jesus Christ is the King of Kings. They claim he is the son of God. You, you may go sit down. We're just going to move on. Thank you. Maybe we'll get back to it. Maybe we'll get to some of that this set later. Are you verified as a follower of Christ? Or are you just a believer? How many believe Jesus Christ came and he was born of a virgin? How many believe that this morning? Okay. How many believe he died for the sins of the world? Okay. How many believe that he rose again on the third day? Okay. How many will follow him no matter what? easy are you willing to die for him right now it's easy in this context in this setting to say yeah absolutely 100% I'll believe him I, I will die for him today but when the rubber hits the road when you're out there in this world, will you be a verified follower of Christ? Are you afraid to share your faith in front of a world that hates this faith? If you're afraid to share your faith, you may just be a believer and not a follower. Pastor, this seems harsh. I'm in a church full of people that have been walking with Jesus, so you say, for many, many years. How many have been walking with Jesus for more than 25 years? Hands everywhere. You know, my kids aren't 25 yet, so they can't raise their hands. But are you a follower of Jesus? Are you a verified follower of Jesus? See, we live in a world that we have to we have to make sure that what we that what we give our money to that where we go the doctors we visit uh, the, the the accounts that were that that, that 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 we have are verified what does verified mean in this world's context well I'm glad you asked because this is what it means according to Twitter anybody use Twitter anybody know of well what used to be Twitter now it's X X, formerly known as Twitter. Anybody who knows of Twitter? Nobody in here has raised their hand for Twitter. But how many who knows of it? Elon Musk bought it out. There was a whole big thing, right? This is what they say a verified account is. According to Twitter, a verified account is any account of public interest that has been authenticated by the company itself. Basically, in short, what it means is you say you are who you say you are when your account is verified by Twitter or X. On Instagram, we look for it on Instagram. How many, uh, how many use Facebook? I can tell you, you're, you're using Instagram as well. 
because Facebook owns Instagram. So if you are looking for being verified on Instagram, this is what it means. It signals to other users, when you're verified on Instagram, it signals to other users on the platform that an account really belongs to the user, artist, brand, or organization it represents. As a matter of fact, any social media account that you have, you're looking for, you're looking to be verified on any social media platform, it means that you have been proven as to who you are. Your identity has been proven to the social media platform. And you gain a verified label in return, usually in the form of a check mark. How many have seen that check mark beside accounts on social media or some other things that you use right that's what you're looking for that's the, how many knew that's what that little check mark meant good you're look that's what you're looking for but what what about when it comes to the real world professions what about when it comes to something that you use in the real world not social media land not the metaverse as it's called what about real world professions do you think you need to find somebody that's been verified? How many would just go to a doctor that, that looks like they, 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 they got their, their certification off an internet? How, would you? If they just got their certification off the internet, like say you can do being ordained as a minister to marry people, would you go to somebody that's been just verified on the internet? So in the real world, let's look at psychology today. If you are looking for help mentally, you're looking for someone that knows what they're talking about. So say in psychology today, to be verified by psychology today, it indicates that the professional's license or primary credential has been fact-checked by the psychology today team. In other words, You'll find the professional's name, the contact details, the license or accreditation, and, and you'll, you'll want to make sure that all of that, the, all that stuff is up to date. Otherwise, you may be talking to Miss Cleo. How many remember Miss Cleo? The, 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 the psychic, the 900 psychic line. How many, now, now how many remember? So what about a doctor? Wouldn't you want to go, as I said, wouldn't you want to go to a doctor that's been verified? Well, you can do that. As a matter of fact, you can research a doctor. All you do is put his information in, into this site. This, this, the, the, go to the Federation of State Medical Boards, FSMB, their website, and you can check the basics on docinfo.org, and you'll find all the accreditations that he has. If he's board certified, his education, the states that he's act, has active licenses in, and any and any actions that are against him. Did you know that? Did you know you can go there and find that? How many knew that? Miss Miss Lane might. She she worked in the medical field. So you want to go to somebody that knows what they're talking about that's been certified, right? Oh, so everybody in here is just you to go out to the, to the to the street and get your get your treatment on the street. Then nobody's hands went up. I'm confused. Are you willing to go out there to 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 uh, to J W who walks the street? And what what if he walks up to you and says he's a doctor? Would you go to him? So how many would want to know that your doctor has been verified? How many got, have got, been to the doctor's office and you see certifications hanging on the wall? Exactly. So, you want to make sure your doctor knows what he's talking about. What about a mechanic? What about a mechanic? What are you looking for? According to AAA, AAA said when you're looking for a mechanic, you are looking for one who is ASE certified, Automotive Service Excellence, that tests all kinds of different things as far as real world technologies and auto repair skills. You want to make sure he can do what he says he can do, right? In addition to passing a written test, the technician who wants to be ASE certified must document at least two years of hands-on industry experience 
once he certified the from the ASE, the technician then retest every five years to remain certified. How many want to take your baby, the car you're driving, the car you may spend more time in than you do at home, to just any shade tree mechanic? Especially today's automobile. I had to take mine up to the Fields Mazda because it gave a, it gave it gave this weird uh, gave this weird uh, uh, error message, and I'm just like, I'm not going to take it just to somebody down here that changes tires. I'm going to take it to my dealer so they can fix this computer problem. And they did. It's amazing. So you want to look at you're wanting to look for somebody who is certified, who's verified, who's been verified by experts in their field. So well, how does this how does this come down to what we're talking about today? Well, let's look at the definition of verified first. Verified means, according to Webster's Dictionary, to establish the truth, accuracy, or reality thereof. So you want to make sure the truth is there. You want to make sure the accuracy is there. So when it comes to being a believer and a follower, you say that many times already this morning. What does it mean to be a believer? What does it mean to be a follower? And how does it tie into the verified definition? I'm glad you asked. Because we're going to look at it. To be a believer, the definition, according to Webster's Dictionary, is one who considers something to be true or honest. One who accepts the word or evidence of. One who holds something as an opinion. That sounds pretty good, right? Everybody in here believes Jesus, believes in Jesus, right? So you believe in Jesus. You believe that, it, it's, it, it, that, that you, you're accepting the word of God. You're accepting the evidence of the fact that Jesus was here. Okay? How is that different from... Glad you asked. Well, you didn't really ask. Somebody asked, what's the difference between a follower and a believer? I'm glad. I'm glad you asked, Bob. Glad you asked. Ray was back there too. You just beat him to it. I'm glad you asked. A follower, it's really interesting. A follower is one that follows the opinions or teachings of another. One that imitates another. Or you go into the archaic, and I love this. The archaic definition of being a follower is one that chases. So are you a believer in Jesus? Or are you chasing Jesus? Do you see the difference? Oh. See, Jesus dealt with this in his time. And our text this morning is going to be in chapter 9, verses 57 to 62. I'll have it on the screen, but you can look it up. I want you to go ahead. If you have your Bible, how many have your Bible this morning? I got mine, even though it's on the screen. Because I never know what God's going to do. It's always important to have your word with you because you never know what God's going to do, how he's going to speak to you, what scripture he's going to bring up to you. Amen? Oh, I got one amen. Thank you. Luke chapter 9, verses 57 to 62. Now, once again, I'm in the CSB. And this is what the Lord says this morning. This is Jesus. This is an account within Jesus. As they were traveling on the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus told him, Foxes have dens, and birds of the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Then he said to another, Follow me. Lord, he said, First let me go bury my father. But he, being Jesus, told him, Let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and spread the news of the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go and say goodbye to the house. But Jesus said to him, 
No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. So are you a follower or are you a believer? Are you a verified follower of Jesus today? Or are you just a believer? See, we see many, we see three different accounts here of Jesus dealing with people that said, I will follow you. The first account, Jesus said, I don't have anywhere to stay. Will you let me in? Then he looked at another person and said, follow me. And this person said, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. I got to go bury the dead. And Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead. And then the third account, Jesus said, or he just looked at Jesus and said, I'm going to follow you wherever you go. But first, wait, I got something. I, I need to go take care of my stuff at the house. I need to go say goodbye to my, to my family. Notice that Jesus said, those who turn back from the plow aren't worthy of the kingdom of God. Are you, Kylie, will you stop my phone? Are you a believer or are you a follower? Are you a believer or are you a follower? So let's break this down. We're going to break this passage down and we're going to look at it. The first one that he, that he had the encounter with, he said, follow me. Actually, he said, I will follow you. He said, I will follow you. Sorry. He said, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said, I don't have anywhere to sleep tonight. Will you help me? Will you let me in? So what is Jesus saying here? If you're going to be a true follower of Jesus, not just a believer, you have to allow him full access to everything in your life. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, it's, really, it's, it's really quiet right now. Oh, wait a minute. You mean he's looking in that box that I've got back here in the corner? Yeah. Wait, you mean to tell me he needs to look in that closet where I've got all my skeletons? Yeah. Wait, you mean to tell me all that stuff that I've kind of just swept under the rug so nobody knows about it? Yeah. He needs to have full access. It's just like Bob said. He already knows about it anyway. He already knows the human heart. He already knows everything there is to know about you, so why are you trying? to hide things from him because if you're trying to hide things from him and keep things from him you're not a follower of Jesus you're only a believer of Jesus oh yeah you should have known I was going to come back with some fire my first sermon back you should have known it was going to come with some fire so the question is does Jesus have complete and full access to your life. Would he come in today and say, I don't have anywhere to sleep. Can I, can I come sleep at your house? Just like it is. How many know when you have people coming over, you know, you know people are coming over, that's the time. Oh, gosh, we got to hurry up. There's people coming. We got to clean the house. How many do that? How many have to do that because stuff's out of place? How many have to do that because you hadn't swept in two weeks? How many? Do, how many I'm serious. We all, we all do that. So we find out the pastor's coming over. Well, nobody, nobody's invited me over, so it doesn't really matter about that. But, but, but you have family or friends that come over. Not your pastor. You have family or friends to come over. Or the realtor. That's when you, oh, I got to clean my house. Right? Jesus comes in and says, I want to come to your house today. He did that with Zacchaeus, right? He did that with Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, short little man, climbed up in a tree. 
We sing a song about him as, as kids. The kiss was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up. How many could do this? How many could do the all the motions with it and everything? He looked at Zacchaeus up in that tree and said, Zacchaeus, you need to come down because I'm going to your house today. Zacchaeus didn't say, Wait, 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 whoa. You can't come to my house. The housekeeper's not been there in three weeks. I don't know what happened to her. Maybe it was COVID. I don't know. Zacchaeus came right down out of that tree and said, all right, let's go. He didn't care what Jesus saw when he got to his house. In order to be a follower of Jesus and not just a believer, he has to have complete access to your house. Where's our house at now? It's right here. Our physical house, well, what, what, well let's just ask and be honest. Would Jesus be happy with our physical houses right now? Do we have things in our physical houses that he might say, I thought you followed me. What's that doing here? I thought you followed me. What's, why do you have a liquor cabinet? I thought you followed me. What's this internet browser? I thought you followed me. Why, do I, why are there so many Amazon boxes here? You see what I'm saying? To be a follower of Jesus, you have to be all in. You have to be completely open and honest with him. And you know what? When you are a follower of Jesus and not just a believer, when he speaks to you about that thing that it's not necessarily scriptural, that it's a sin, but if he looks at you and says, you need to give that up. Would you? But it's not a sin, God. It's not a sin, Jesus. There's not, your word doesn't say I can't do that. Would you give it up? That's what a follower would do. If you wouldn't be willing to give that up, you're not a follower. You're just a believer. Oh, you see how hard this is going to get today. See, the thing is, today, it's easy to say that we believe in Jesus. Again, in this context, it's easy to say that we're a follower of Jesus, we believe in him. Yeah, I'm, I'm willing to go all out. But does he have complete access to those secret places in your heart? I found this, I found this, uh, this quote from Mark Batterson, Batterson. It's from his book, All In. This is what, he, this is what Mark Batterson said. Most people in most churches think they are following Jesus, but I'm not so sure. They may think they are following Jesus, but the reality is they have invited Jesus to follow them. Oh, I, I, I just heard that. I heard that. Mm, that hit somebody. So are you following Jesus or have you just invited Jesus to follow you. Oh, pastor, now wait a minute. Now, come on now. What's the difference between a follower and a believer? A believer is simply satisfied with the sinner's prayer. A believer is simply satisfied with that get out of hell free card. A believer doesn't need to invite Jesus to follow him into their life. They only invite Jesus to follow them. A believer doesn't feel the need to walk with Jesus. They just want Jesus to walk with them. Are you a believer or a follower? What's the difference between a believer and a follower? A follower will want to be as close to Jesus as they possibly can get. A follower will want Jesus to be as close to them as, they, as he can get. We'll want to be messed with him. We'll want to be right there on his footsteps. We'll want to be for we will want to be so close to Jesus as I've heard this put in the past, we will know the color of his eyes. That's how close to Jesus a follower will want to be. A follower knows they can't take a breath without Jesus. A follower knows that they that, that they can't do anything in this life without Jesus. There is nothing that you can do without Jesus in your life because he is the one that holds the world together. He is the one that holds your body together because Colossians tells us everything was made by him, for him, and moves in him. 
That's what a follower is. A follower will openly ask Jesus to be involved in every aspect of their life. Are you a believer or a follower? Have you just invited Jesus to follow you? Or have you asked him and invited him to be involved in everything in your life? A true follower is transformed by the good news of the gospel. A true follower is transformed by the power of Jesus Christ. A true follower looks at their old old ways, looks at the past and says, boy, I'm a whole lot different now than I was back then because of what Jesus did for me. I mean, do you need scriptural proof to know that? Okay, I got it. Look at Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. This has been coming up in a lot of stuff that I've been reading and, and, and looking at here lately. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and and perfect will of God. Have you been transformed? Have you been transformed into a follower? Not just a believer, because let me tell you something. The danger between uh, of being just a believer is the fact that Satan, Lucifer, the devil himself, and all the demons... They believe in Jesus. So if you're just a believer, you know different than the demons that torment you. A follower is something completely different. Truth is, if we were to live in the time of Acts, we all, how, many, how, many, how many have said, I wish I was a believer in the book of Acts? To see all the stuff that happened. How many have said that before? I have. How many would have how many have said, I would love to have been there to see what Paul did. A dude falls out the window, breaks his neck, and Paul raises him back to life and goes on preaching. Eh, you might have been the guy falling out of the window. Remember, I see everything here, okay? I see everything. From up here, I see everything. That's all I'm gonna say. You might have been the one falling out the window. But the truth is, we say things like that. We make grand statements like that. But the truth is, we would crumble and fall apart. If we take our faith today, and what we say as a follower of Jesus today, and put it back in the book of Acts, with Paul and Peter and Luke, and Mark and, and, and Philip and oh gosh I'm not even talking about Stephen we in today's faith would crumble it's easy to say I'll follow Jesus sitting here it's a whole different thing when the rocks are bashing against your head and you're about to meet Jesus That first little stone would have been thrown if I was Stephen. I would have said, that's it, I'm done. I'm done. I'm just being honest with you today. We have to increase, as Nikki talked about last week, we have to increase our faith. We have to become a follower, not just a believer. We have to become a follower of who he is. I mean, think about it. You look at some of the stuff that the people in the, in the New Testament said. Look at what Paul said in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He wrote that sitting in prison. His life was coming to an end. He knew that he was about to be killed by the Romans. 
And yet he says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. We get a hangnail and we begin to lose our faith in Jesus. We get a little headache and we begin to question whether God is real or not. We're talking people that gave their lives. They gave their lives for the fact that they completely believed in Jesus and not just believed in him, but they told us and they showed us through the New Testament that they followed after him even to the point of death. I would say that they had full, they allowed Jesus full access in their lives, wouldn't you? You read Paul. Paul, man, he was, he, he was man, I'm telling you, for Paul to say, I am the greatest sinner among all of you. Would you say that today? Would you have that humbleness in your heart to say that today? If we were comparing. No, no. I'm the, I'm the biggest sinner of them all. And yet Jesus saved me. Paul allowed full access to Jesus. I mean, not long ago, I asked the question. What would you do if the Lord spoke to you right now and told you to empty your bank account and give it to the homeless? Everyone in here said, whoa, wait now. Everyone did. But what if he did that? That's a part of your life that has a big stronghold, no matter what you believe, that wallet has a big stronghold. There's, I've always said it, and I've always heard it said. True change is shown when the Lord has the full control of the purse strings, the wallet. If Jesus walked in here today physically and said, I want you to give everything to the, to, 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 to the ministry for those in need, the poor, the needy, the orphans, the homeless. Jesus walks in here himself in the physical form and says that we should be saying, absolutely, Lord. Well, he's here today. Whether you realize it or not, he's here today. I brought him with me. I don't know if you brought him with you, but I brought him with me. He's here today. Now, I'm not saying we're going to take up an offering for that. That's not what I'm saying. But is the Lord speaking to your heart today? to become a full access follower of Jesus. Hmm. This is the life the disciples lived. I would say they were verified by Jesus. Are you verified? Are you a verified follower of Jesus today? The next thing that we looked at is that, oh, that's too early. Jesus looked at the second guy and said, follow me. And he said, wait, 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 I, you know, I would love to, but I got to go bury my dad. Right? That's what Jesus said. Or that's what the guy said to Jesus, right? I would love to, but I got to go back. I got to take care of some stuff. Right? That's what, Jesus, that's what the guy said to Jesus, right? And Jesus makes this bold statement and says, let the dead bury the dead. You go proclaim the goodness of God and the kingdom of God to everyone around you. That shows me that what we need to do is we need to detach and pursue. We need to detach from our old ways of life and pursue completely after him. We need to detach from this world and not be worried about this world and follow after him no matter what. We need to detach ourselves from the things of this world that will hold us back and follow after him. Are you willing to do that today? Are you a believer or are you a follower? What's the difference in this case? In this case, the difference between a believer and a follower is that a believer will do what they can to bring along the old life with them. Well, it's okay if I go to the bar on Saturday night, as long as I just show up on Sunday. Well, it's
it's okay if I look at this stuff on the internet as long as I show up on Sunday. Well, it's okay if I go to the lake this Sunday just as long as I'm there next Sunday. Funny thing about that, somebody told me, I, can't, I, I was in a conversation with somebody, <laughs> and I don't want you to think this, but he asked, he looked at me and said, you got a boat yet? And I'm like, no. He said, do you have any golf clubs? I said, no. He said, well, if you do, this is what you can do. On your golf cart, put visitation. And that way when somebody would call you, you can say, oh, well, I'm on visitation right now. He said, if you're on the boat, just name the boat visitation. Oh, well, I'm out on visitation right now. I, I, I'll get to you as soon as I can. I don't. I, I can't remember who I was talking to, but he's always. It was. Uh, it was. It was one of the bus drivers, anyway. <laughs> one of the bus drivers. Kind of. It was humorous. So I was like, okay, that's a pastor joke and a half. Okay. So, but a believer, just a believer, is not willing to cut their ties of the old life. They try to bring the old life and make the Bible form around it instead of them allowing the Spirit of God through the Word of God to carve that out of them. That's a believer. A believer will be distracted by the shiny objects that the devil offers in this world. A believer will admit that Jesus, he was a good teacher, he had good morals, he was a righteous man. Maybe even he was the Son of God, but they haven't yielded themselves over to him completely. They haven't detached themselves from this world. What will a follower do? A follower is someone who will walk away from their old life and yearn to be with Jesus. A follower is someone that will, that will become fixated on Jesus and not divert their eyes to the, to the right or to the left, to the east, the west, the north, the south. They will keep their eyes focused on Jesus and follow after him no matter where he leads them. They will follow after him and, and declare that I am a follower of Jesus. Christ even to the point of death they are not tossed by the winds of the waves and the storms of this life unlike a believer who will be hmm, a follower is fixated on one thing one thing and one thing only as we saw in Romans chapter 12 being pleasing and holy before the Lord are you a believer or are you a follower? See, a follower will also do something else. A believer will still be attached to some of the things of this world. And I was like that for years and years and years. A believer will still want to bring that stuff in. They do it and they know it's a sin. And well, you know, I'll, I'll, just, go, I'll, I'll just go get forgiveness. It's easier to get, this is the life they live by. It's easier to get forgiveness than permission. Anybody ever live like that with Jesus? It's easier to get forgiveness than permission. That's bringing your old lifestyle in and trying to mold the Bible around it. We see a lot of that happening today, don't we? But a follower, a follower, say, you know what? I know it's not in the Bible. I know that... that there's, it, it, it's one of the quote-unquote gray areas. The gray areas are what you need to stay away from as a follower of Jesus. A follower of Jesus will look at those gray areas and say, if there's a chance this is going to displease my father, if there's a chance that this is going to put a barrier between me and him, if there's a chance that this is going to offend my God, I don't want to do it and I will not do it no matter what the cost see there must be a detaching that happened there must be this detaching ourselves from the past the things of this world the chains that so easily wrap us up and drag us down in order to pursue him we have to let go of the chains. We have to let go of the things that are weighing us down. The things that have come in between us and the Father. Do you need proof? Do you need scripture? Okay, I got you. 
I got it. I, wouldn't, I, I would want to know there was proof to this too. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we also have such a large crowd of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the Father, at, at the right hand of the throne of God. Do you see that? The writer of Hebrews tells us that we should lay aside every hindrance and the sin that takes us by surprise. Is that what he said? Did he say we should lay aside the hindrance and the sin that was waiting in ambush for us? Or is that term easily up there? Do you see it? You mean that we as believers can easily get tripped up by sin and hindrances that will hold us back? <gasps> Is that what it, do you get that? Again, notice who he's talking to. The, the name of the book is what? <laughs> and these are Hebrews that believe in Jesus, so they're Messianic Hebrews. So that means he is talking to, to you, the church. He is talking to the church. Does everybody see that? He is talking to, look at your neighbor and say, he's talking to you. Look back at your other neighbor and say, he's talking to me. So, all right, so, so let's go back to this then. Let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares me. I'm not changing the word of God. I'm making it personal. Say that. Let us lay aside, wait, okay, hold on. Let me lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares me. We want it all to be about me. Well, this is what the writers of, of the scripture tell us. You want it all to be about you? You need to go ahead and lay that thing down then. Because it's going to hinder you. And it's going to turn into sin that will easily keep you out of heaven. Anybody want to be kept out of heaven? Woo. See, we, we, we see there that we've got to, there has to be this detaching in order to pursue. Now, the Olympics just ended. Everybody knows about the Olympics, right? What they didn't show you what they would never show you is the number of athletes that were praying and praising God as they were doing their as they were doing their events as they were receiving their medals they were praying and praising God they'll never show you that instead they'll show you that nonsense that would that started everything off that started off that way but it ended up with people praising God and giving him glory anyway so the Olympics just ended and we see we know that they work hard in their training the thing is they may, while they're training, put weights on themselves to grow stamina, to, to get greater strength, to increase their speed, and the different things that, because it helps. It's helpful when you're training as an Olympic athlete. But notice, did anybody watch any of the races? Did anybody watch anybody doing anything? I watched, I watched a little bit of it. You don't see the basketball players running down, run, running down the court with ankle weights on. You don't see the runners that are running around that track with, with carrying a 50-pound bag of weight on their back. They may train like that to increase, their, to increase their physical endurance. 
But when it comes race time, all of those things are put off to the side because they want to win the race. There is no way they can win the race if they're going to be weighed down by things of uh, the, the, by the things they were using to train. They're not going to be they, they they can't be weighed down if they're swimming. They they'll sink if they're swimming. They can't be weighed down when they're actually running the race, when they're trying to win at their competition. That is what the writer of Hebrews is telling us. We cannot win this thing in life if we're holding on to the past, if we're allowing those things to wrap around us, if, if those things are weighing us down. We've got to cut ties. We've got to cut them off of us if we want to run the race with endurance and win this thing in the end. I mean, you look at the way the disciples lived. They lived with the expectation that they were going to see Jesus. They were focused on Jesus. They had detached themselves from the things of the past, and they had focused their eyes on Jesus. We see that with Stephen as he's being stoned to death. He, was, he had been separ completely sever severed his ties to the world, and as those stones began to hit him in the head, as those big rocks, those boulders were crashing down on him, he looks up into the heavens and he sees Jesus and he is no longer concerned about this world, but he has now got Jesus in his sight and he doesn't care what happens to his physical body. He is ready to meet Jesus because Jesus was there with open arms ready to welcome him home. Amen. What about you? Do you have things that are weighing you down? Do you have things that are, that, that, that are keeping you from pursuing after Jesus? We don't want to do this because it requires something. I'm just going to be honest with you. The American church today does not want to do this. They don't want to detach and pursue. Why? Because there's requirements. If you want to chase after Jesus, there's requirements. And the pastor calls a fast for the church we don't want to do that today's we're having a dinner at work I can't do that man my mama made my favorite I can't do that that would require me giving up my Starbucks I mean come on what no I don't come on Okay, well, uh, and then we then we begin to bargain, don't we? Well, how about if I just if I just how about if I just I don't know I, how about if I just give up caffeine for a week? You make it two days in, you're feeding after that caffeine, you've, and, and you fail. You're just like, oh, okay, well, I'll just drink it for lunch then. And then you realize, oh wait, I needed to wake up. Okay, all right, so I'll just I'll just skip it at dinner. You see, this is what we do. We have a problem when, when, when it comes to pushing away from the table because what hap what's happened in our world is our food has become our God. If you don't believe me, go to another country and order what you would order here. And you'll see the portion sizes in other countries are nothing like they are here. Food has become a God. We don't want to give any extra for the kingdom of God. I give my tithes and, and I give, I give, I give the, a couple of quarters after that, so I'm good. We don't want to give extra when it comes to God. We don't want to live in complete obedience to the word of God and trusting in him completely. We don't, if, if, if the pastor comes up and says, well, I believe we need to, we, we, we need to have a, an offering to where we give 90% to the Lord one week and keep 10 for ourselves and see what the Lord does. Oh, that makes us uncomfortable. We don't want to give any extra time to the church. Well, I was, I've been, I, I go there Sundays and Wednesdays, so I have a meeting this day, so that's a third day, and and oh gosh, we've got prayer. Well, that's that's another day, so that's that's four days out of my week. I'm coming to the church. I don't want to do that. That's a little bit too much. Anybody, anybody ever said it? Come on. 
We don't want to give any extra time. We don't want to sacrifice any of our resources before the Lord, even though it tells us in Romans that we are to live as a living sacrifice. Do you understand what a living sacrifice is? Do you understand what they did when they sacrificed? Sacrifice things. They gave that up. There was no way they could hold it back because it was a sacrifice. The Lord is telling us in Romans that we need to live as a living sacrifice before Him. We need to give all of our resources, everything we are, everything that we will be, everything that we have been, we need to give it all to Him and to live for Him in all His glory. Oh, Pastor, now come on now. I mean, God forbid, God forbid that he would require us to give up our phone. God forbid that he would require us to push away from our computer. God forbid that we give up our internet connection and our Wi-Fi and our TV to spend more time with him. <gasps> follower and a believer. A follower will give all that stuff up willingly. See, in Matthew chapter 16, we read some hard words. We don't like to read these words. Because when we read these words, we begin to ask, what would that look like in today's lifestyle? What would that look like today? What does Jesus think of the way we live today? What would the disciples say if they walked in this church and saw all the amenities we have today? What would they say? Because in Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 to 26, the word of the Lord tells us this, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wants to follow, 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 I think it's the seven times, follow, after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me will find it. For what benefit, for what will it benefit someone if he gains the whole world yet loses his life? Or what will anyone give in exchange for his life when's the last time you denied yourself anything believer and a follower deny himself take up his cross follow me it's easy to sit here or in the comfort of our home and read that line and say that is so good Jesus that's such a good line Jesus I'm going to put that as a meme I'm going to put that out there for Facebook and so everybody can read that but do we live it do we live it when is the last time that you have truly, truly, truly denied yourself anything. When's the last time that you actually picked up your cross to follow him? See, the cross, you gotta, you got to remember, the cross was a shameful thing. This is a symbol of shame. This is a symbol that you were convicted to die. This is a symbol that it was an outward sign of the conviction of what you did wrong. So for Jesus to use this analogy to people that were living in the days of crucifixion, this was a shocking metaphor. This was a shocking analogy. See, when we made it known outwardly that we believe in Jesus as the one true God, you got to put rubber. You got to put rubber to the road. You got to. You you seriously have to say, "Am I? Do I really, really want to follow after Jesus at that point in time?" 
Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You want to talk, you want to get people upset? Just start quoting that to them. And you'll see who your friends are, and you'll see who the people are that you need to, you need to attach yourself to. Because Jesus is the difference maker. Jesus is the one that changed everything. Jesus didn't say, I am one of the ways. Jesus said, if you don't go through me, you, he, he didn't say, you, if you don't go through me, you can go through Hindus, you can go through Buddha, you can go through Joseph Smith, you can go through any of these other avenues. No, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you want to get to him, you have to go through me. I am the only way. Do you want to? who your friends are you want to see where they stand in this world you go ahead and start talking to them about that and see if you don't get persecuted and see if you don't get some hate thrown your way because Jesus is not one of many ways Jesus is the only way and he is looking for you to detach yourself from this world and pursue after him if you want to be a follower of his are you verified today? Are you a verified follower of Jesus Christ? The last thing, I promise. I'm, I'm trying to quit. The last thing that Jesus talked about. He looked at this guy, this third, this third example, and said, follow me. Well, Lord. Anybody ever been like that? Well, Lord, <laughs> I got some conditions. Anybody bought a car and you said that? All right, well, I like this car, but let's do this. Okay, so you give me this, I'll give you this. Anybody ever, ever wheel and deal like that when you're buying a car? Anybody ever bought a house? That's, that's kind of what you do when you buy a house. Well, this foundation's bad. If they fix that and they do this and they do that, then, I'll, you know, then, we'll, then we'll get an offer, right? This is what happened. Jesus looked at this guy and said, follow me. Well, Lord, <laughs> one thing, hold, hold on, just hold on. Can I go say goodbye to my family? And another shocking statement that Jesus makes, if you go back, you're not worthy of the kingdom. <gasps> if Jesus looked at you today and said that, that would kick you in the stomach, wouldn't it? Knock all the wind out of your sails. What Jesus is saying is, is and, and this is terminology that I'm, I'm learning from these three, or my three kids here. <laughs> they, are now, they now refer to, if they want to work out, if they want to, if they want to get up and, and they want to be serious about something, they lock in. Right, guys? You know what you say? Okay, they're, they're sleeping, so... <laughs> they're not locked into the service this morning. They decided to, to get locked in on... Anyway... <laughs> But this is what the kids are saying now. I'm locked in. Well, you know what? We need to get locked in on Jesus. We need to get locked in on him. We need to get locked in on reading this word. We need to get locked in on what's important to him, not to us. See, believers are swayed by any number of things. Believers will be swayed by what the culture says. Believer will be swayed when the certain political party comes up and says this. The, the, the believers will be swayed by their friends. The believers will be swayed by whatever makes them feel comfortable at the moment. A follower is totally different. A believer may change their mind, as we've seen. If you've watched anything <laughs> and politically... Anybody seen some mind-changing statements going on recently? I, I, I'm, not, I'm not getting political, but you, you have things that are being played back you know, four years ago, and now they're saying something different. Believers can change their mind, and we've seen that in this world. They will be influenced by friends. They will be intimidated to do certain things in order to fit in so on and so on and so on when a follower is locked in it doesn't matter what the popular opinions may say it doesn't matter what their friends may do when someone is locked in on Jesus it doesn't matter who stands against them it doesn't matter if they pull out the biggest sword you've ever seen and say you either deny Jesus or I'm going to take your head off right here it doesn't matter to them when you're locked in on Jesus 
It doesn't matter what the world says because you're going to follow after him. A follower will not change their mind in the midst of extreme persecution. They are locked in on what Jesus says no matter the opposition that comes against them. Locked in on Jesus. What, what do you find that? Where, where's scriptural proof for that? Well, just. I actually go back to the Old Testament for this. The Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 50. Isaiah chapter 50, verse 7. This is what the word of the Lord says this morning. The Lord God will help me. Therefore, I have been humiliated. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint. And I know I will not be put to shame. What does that term flint mean? That means I have set my, set my face like a stone. I watched to watch some things here recently. It's, it's really interesting. Uh, anybody know of Easter Island? Easter Island. You know, all those, all those statues that are standing there and are looking up to the sky. They're looking off that way. So they're, they're just, the thing is, they don't, I don't know exactly how old those things are. They're many thousands of years old. And the crazy thing is, they're still looking up to the sky. In those years, nothing has changed their expression. In those years, they have not suddenly turned and started looking off that way. If they're looking east, they haven't turned around and started looking west. If they're looking north, they haven't turned around and, look, and, and begin looking south. They have stayed there in that position for thousands of years because their face is, fa is set in stone and they cannot do anything but look up and look eastward, westward, whichever way they're looking. Is your face set like a stone toward Jesus? A believer and a follower. A believer will be swayed by this world and they will begin to look at the waves around them as Peter did. Peter's a great example of walking on water. He believed in Jesus at that point in time. He believed what Jesus said. Jesus said, it's me, I'm here. Peter said, if it's you, tell me to come on out in the water. Jesus said, okay. G Peter believed. Now, we, now we, give, you know, we give shade to Peter, but he's the only one who believed. He got out of the boat. Peter believed strongly for a minute. He got out of the boat. The problem is his eyes weren't fixed on Jesus. His eyes were fixed on staying on Jesus. He got out there and said, whoo, look at me, I'm dancing. Look at me, I'm walking on water, guys. Look at this, check this out. Then he began to look at the storm. Then he began to look at the waves. Then he began to feel the rain pounding on his face. Then he began to experience the wind blowing in his face. Then he began to say, "Get all!" he began, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. I'm, he began to look everywhere else except on Jesus. Had he kept his eyes on Jesus, he would have kept walking to Jesus, and they would have walked back to the boat. But that's not what happened to Peter. Peter got his eyes off of Jesus, and the next thing we see is, is Jesus reaching down and got him out of the water, and he had to be carried back to the boat because he lacked the faith in Jesus. He believed but he wasn't a follower yet, was he? He wasn't a follower yet. See, the Lord is looking for people that are locked in on him today. He is looking for you to lock in on him today. He is looking for you to lock in and not be intimidated or influenced by this world. A true follower is going to lock in when times are great and when times are bad. I'm giving this message today because I'm telling you, this country is at a strategic inflection point right now. And we, the, the, when it comes election time, it could be that our world in America is going to change. Our freedoms could be stripped away from us. Our freedom to assemble in this place could be stripped away from us. 
our freedoms to read our Bible could be stripped away from us. Our freedoms that we are enjoying today may very well be stripped away from us in an instant. That will tell you and that will show who is just a believer and who is a follower. A true follower is not going to care what culture says. A true follower is going to be so locked in on Jesus that they will say, I want to be holy because you are holy. If you can't say that today, then you are just a believer. If you can't say, I want to be holy because my God is holy, you're just a believer. If you're going to tell yourself today, there's nothing in my life that I need to get rid of, I need to clean up, there's nothing in my life that I need to completely turn over to him, then you are just a believer. You are not a follower. As I'm studying this, as I've been going through this, let me tell you, I, I was over here last night, and, and that song that we sang this morning was playing, and, and, and I just had tears streaming down my face. Because in his presence... I realize my dirtiness. Isaiah said it. My righteousness is as faithful rags. It is, it is as filthy rags when it comes to being before Jesus. But when it comes to being before God. My righteousness is not worthy of his presence. There is always something in your life you've got to work on. There's always something the Lord is going, to, is going to prompt you. You know what? You're spending too much time doing this. I want you to give this up, and I want you to start spending time with me. As I've been going through this this week, this is, this is what's been, it's been weighing on me. I've, actually, I've been working on this for two weeks. He's been pointing things out. He's been poking me, and he's been prodding me, and he's been saying... That needs to go. You need to clean this up. This, uh, this is me, your pastor, because I am just a man. I am a man that is in need of a Savior. And if I want to follow after Jesus, I've got to, be, I've got to allow him full access into my life. I've got to detach myself from this world, and I've got to pursue him. And in, if I'm going to pursue him, I've got to be locked in on him and him alone. If there is something that's holding you back, today is the day. You strip it off. And you begin your pursuit of him. See, have you allowed him full access into your life? I mean full and complete access. The secret places, the things that nobody else knows, have you allowed him full access to your life? Have you detached yourself? Have you detached yourself from this world and are you ready to pursue him? Because when you pursue him, you can't be looking backwards. That's another thing about the Olympic runners, right? Especially in the relays, right? Think about it. How can they make a clean exchange with that baton if you have the runner that has the baton looking in behind him? He's running up there, and how can he, how can he have a clean exchange if he's doing this? How can he be running his full force if he's doing this? You have to let things go. The things of the past. The things that you might find pleasurable. You have to detach yourself from this world and pursue him. And as you're pursuing him, you have to lock in because, again, the Olympic runner, 
that runner that has the baton. That runner that has the baton. They're about to make the exchange. And they're not looking around. They're not looking at somebody else. They are looking at the person in front of them. They are looking at their hand. They are focused in. They are locked in on that hand and because they want to make sure they have the clean exchange so that they can go and win the race. They're not looking behind. They're not looking at anything else. They are locked in on their goal. What is your goal? There's a decision that needs to be made right now with everyone in this building. Are you willing? And are you ready to pursue after Him? Nothing holding you back. Nothing weighing you down. Are you ready? Why don't you take whatever time you have left on this earth and allow Jesus the full access he wants to have in your life? Detach yourself and pull away from this world and pursue after him. And lock in and say, I'm not letting anything hold me back any longer. I am focused on Jesus. If you're watching by way of social media, the internet, website, whatever you're watching by. I want to talk to you for just a minute. If you've heard this message today, everybody in here, I know their relationship with Jesus. But if you're watching and you don't have a relationship with Jesus and the the Lord has pricked you and, and you felt that, you felt that voice inside of you say you need to get things right with him, that's the Holy Spirit convicting you right now. And if you don't have a relationship with him, if you don't have a relationship with him, it's an easy fix. It's an easy fix. All you have to do is repeat this prayer after me. And you can fix your relationship with him. And you can become a follower of his. So if that's you today and you want to make that step and you want to do what's necessary to become a follower of Jesus Christ, repeat this prayer after me. Say, Jesus, I'm all in. I don't want my old life anymore. There's nothing but emptiness. There's nothing but brokenness. There's nothing but destruction in that old life. I've tried. And it's to follow after you. I want to be more than just a believer in you. I want to follow after you. So I give you all of me right now. I detach myself from the world and I want to pursue you. I am locked in on you. I confess with my mouth that you are king. You are Lord. You are the king of my heart. You're the Lord of my life. And I believe it in my heart. I have moved from just believing to where I am now a follower. I believe it in my heart that you died for my sins. And I give everything over to you right now. My warts, my problems, my issues, the good things, the bad things, the past, everything. I turn it over to you right now and say, I will follow after you. In your precious name, I pray. Now, if you prayed that prayer, I want you to let us know by messaging us, commenting on this video. Let us know that you have made the step to become a follower of Jesus Christ, and we want to help you as much as we can. We want to get materials to you. If you live in the area, we want to connect with you here in person. We want to connect with you through social media. We want to connect with you. So if you said that prayer for the first time, or the hundredth time, it doesn't matter. We want to connect with you. So let us know by commenting, messaging us. And let me just say, welcome to the family. We 
we want to be an encouragement to you.